And today we're going to do John 17, 20 to 26. I am praying not only for this disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one, as we are one. I am in them, and, they, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity, that the world will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. They can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world does, doesn't know you, but I do, and these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you, you to them, and I will continue to, to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luna. I wonder if you've ever stopped to ask, what does Jesus want? What does Jesus want? This next month, uh, Americans are going to be wishing for things pretty hard. Americans will be, will be wanting a better economy. We'll be wanting better protections for the environment. We'll be wanting more and better jobs. We'll be wanting better provisions for the poor. We'll be wanting uh, better border security and better uh, treatment for immigrants. Hearts across this country this next month are going to be wanting a lot of things. And eyes across this country the next month are going to be fixed on Washington. Our eyes are going to be fixed on the polls, or they're going to be fixed on the, the headlines, they're going to be fixed on Twitter. They're going to be trying to discover any daylight between the candidate who we think is going to deliver uh, the things that we want from the other candidate so that our hearts can be at peace. Have you ever stopped to ask, what does Jesus want? Or wondered, where are his eyes fixed? For the next few weeks, that's the question we're going to be searching out together. And we're going to be looking at what does Jesus want? What's the desire burning within him? Where is his gaze focused? In order to do this, we're going to listen in on Jesus in prayer. Jesus prayed a lot, as you can imagine. Even if there were no greater reason than his cultural location as a devout Jewish man in a highly religious a first century Mediterranean context, uh, we would expect him to be a prayerful man. But Jesus was no ordinary Jewish man. Prayer was so central to Jesus' life uh, that it's the one thing we see his disciples ask him to teach them to do. Have you ever thought about that? That's crazy. He walked on water. He multiplied food. He calms storms. He, he healed the sick. He tangles with the leading minds of his day. He shows compassion to the most stepped-on souls of his day. He raises the dead. And that's not what his disciples ask him to teach them to do. He turns water into wine. And that's not what his disciples ask him to teach them to do. Not even Peter. They ask him to teach them to pray. And presumably, uh, almost all of them had been taught from the cradle how to pray. They would have learned in their Jewish homes daily to pray the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. They would have learned from the cradle to pray daily the tefillah, the, the prayers set for the day. They would have learned to pray the Psalms like Jesus would have learned from his mother. So why would these people ask Jesus to teach them to pray? Presumably, it's because they understood that his relationship with the Father expressed in prayer undergirded all those other things he did. As one preacher has put it, Jesus 
lived and died praying. All the great hinge moments of his life, we see him praying. Did you notice that it's at Jesus' baptism, while he's praying, that the heavens open and you hear the Father say, this is my beloved Son. That night before Jesus selects his 12 followers, he spends the night alone in prayer, conversation with the Father. Can you imagine? God, are you, Father, are you sure about Judas? This is going to go badly. Peter, man, that is some extra patience required. James and John, lovable but so combustible. And Father, a Roman collaborator and a freedom fighter? How on earth are we going to create something beautiful and new from this motley crew? On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus prays, and Peter and James and John, who are there with him, see the, the curtain drawn back, as it were, and, and, and his heavenly glory shines out of him like the noonday sun. At the tomb of his friend Lazarus, Jesus prays. On the night of his, his betrayal, he, he pours out his heart to the Father in spiritual and in emotional combat such that he sweats, his sweat drops from his head like droplets of blood. 22 times the Gospels record that Jesus prays. He lives and he dies praying. But most of those occasions, uh, he has withdrawn to solitude, and we are not privy to the content of his prayers. On one occasion, though, we, we hear him pray at length. And that one longer prayer is recorded for us in John chapter 17 after uh, this culmination of four chapters seen that, that, that we call the upper room discourse. Jesus is with his disciples one last time in Jerusalem. They withdraw to an upper room. He washes their feet as a precursor of, of what's to come. They share a meal together. And then he teaches them uh, all the final things that they need to know in order to carry on the ministry that he has given them. He teaches them about the Holy Spirit, the one who will guide them and encourage them and instruct them and empower them once he has returned to heaven. He teaches them about remaining in God's love. And then, now, in John chapter 17, he prays. Verse 1 says this, After saying all these things about the Holy Spirit and about abiding in God's love, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father. As John tells the story, in these moments before he heads to the Olive Grove where he'll be arrested and then he'll go to the cross, Jesus' eyes are fixed on the face of the Father in heaven. And now we will hear what Jesus wants. Jesus in prayer. Have you thought about this? God the Son speaking to God the Father through the Spirit. This is God praying to God. Daryl Johnson, who taught Jill and me to preach, calls this the conversation at the center of the universe. You might wonder what's different when Jesus prays than when you or I pray. In some ways, not a lot. In other ways, a whole heap. James will remind his readers in, in, in chapter 5, verse 16 of the, the book of James, uh, the prayer of a righteous person accomplishes a lot. Righteousness is about a right relationship. Relationship matters. You might remember in the Old Testament book of, of Esther, Mordecai discovers a plot uh, to kill the Jewish refugees in Persia. But he has no relationship with the king. And so he tells Esther, who's the queen, because she has a relationship with the king. She will be hurt. You might remember that uh, slightly strange scene in John chapter 2 when Jesus saves that wedding party from the incredible embarrassment of running out of wine. It looks like Jesus probably doesn't plan on doing anything, but it's when his mother urges him to do something that Jesus intervenes. Relationship matters. Four times in this prayer, 
we hear Jesus ask the Father. In verse 9, we hear it twice. My prayer, or I ask, is not for the world, but I ask for those you have given me because they belong to you. In verse 15, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Once more, in verse 20, I am praying, or the word here, the verb is, I ask, not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. The word that Jesus uses here for asking uh, is the verb erotao. It's a completely normal verb for asking uh, in Greek. Um, it occurs some 63 times in the New Testament. It means to, to ask or to interrogate or to beseech or to beg. Uh, and regularly in the New Testament, we see people erotaoing other people. We see uh, superiors erotaoing their subordinates. We see peers erotaoing uh, peers. But we never see anyone erotaoing God in prayer. Only Jesus. John seems to be making a point out of this because uh, just earlier in, in chapter 16, verse 26, he'll say this. Speaking, Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says, Then you will ask, he uses a different verb here, in my name. And I'm not saying that I will ask, erotao, the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you clearly or dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. So the, the, the disciples, eteo, but Jesus erotaos in his own standing. You're like, Ian, this is so dull. What are you doing this for? You don't need to understand anything about Greek to see that, that, that John is reserving this special word for a standard of asking that only Jesus has. Only Jesus makes requests of the Father peer to peer. Only the Father and the Son and the Spirit make requests of this sort of boldness within the triune God. Here's the question, what is it that Jesus is asking the Father in this bold, peer-to-peer -peer manner? What is it that Jesus wants? We only have four weeks, so we're going to focus our attention on verses 20 through 26. Look with me at verse 20. Jesus makes a shift in his prayer. He's prayed for himself. He's prayed for the other disciples there in the room with him. And then in verse 20, he prays this. I am praying not only for these disciples, Peter and James and John and the rest, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Do you hear this? Now God the Son is telling God the Father what he wants on behalf of all who will ever believe in him through the message of those disciples in the room. So this is the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. This is the crowds at Pentecost. This is Lydia. This is uh, the, the second century French slave girl Blandina. This is, this is uh, Irenaeus and Augustine. This is Everyone from that second generation of believers on down to you and to me. We get to hear not only what Jesus wants from the Father, but what he wants from the Father for us. My kids know that Jill and I pray for them. But not infrequently, one of them will sneak out of bed at night and come to Jill and me and say, would you pray for me? I could say, you know we pray for you. Now go back to bed. But usually I don't. Usually I'm delighted, to, I'm delighted that they want to hear their earthly father pray to their heavenly father what I desire for them. I think it comforts them to hear it. I think it makes it a little bit more real for them to hear it. But I also make a habit of praying for them out loud in their own hearing each night because I want them to hear what matters most to me for them. I'm not praying daily that they're going to get an A plus on the next spelling quiz or that they're going to make a lot of money or score a hat trick that week. I probably should pray that they'll at least make enough to take care of their parents in retirement. But 
There's a place for each of those. But the things I pray for them daily are the things that are, are most important, that I want most for them, that they be filled with the Holy Spirit, that they lean the weight of their lives on Jesus, that they grow the fruit of these things. Daryl Johnson suggests that there are at least three reasons that the Holy Spirit leads John to record Jesus' prayer for us here. Firstly, he says, uh, it's so that Jesus' disciples and we will hear Jesus' heart's desire. Back in chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus says to his followers, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Because everything the Father has shown me, I have shown you. I have read you in. I've brought you in. Sharing his heart for the disciples with his disciples is Jesus' way of showing friendship to them. Secondly, uh, John probably records this for us so that we have an idea of what Jesus continues to pray for us now that he's ascended to the throne in heaven. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 said that Jesus lives eternally so that he can intercede for us eternally. Did you, did you know that right now the Son of God has the ear of the Father of God and they're talking about you? They are conspiring together for our good. Have, have, you, have you ever wondered what they're talking about? I know I do. And I think a, a pretty good guess is that it includes this, these things that he prays out loud in the hearing of his disciples and that the Holy Spirit causes to be recorded. And thirdly, Daryl suggests, this is recorded so that we might be caught up in Jesus praying. By that, I think he means that the more that we reflect on the goodness of what Jesus is praying, the more we're going to want what Jesus wants. The more we're going to start to ask for what Jesus is asking for. Very occasionally, uh, Jill and I will poll our kids for input on, say, what we do with some of our summer holidays. What should we do this summer, guys, we might ask. And the youngest might say, could we get ice cream sometime? And we're like, yeah, ma'am. I bet we could do that. And the next one say, might say, could, could we go to the zoo and see some raccoons? I'd say, I bet, I bet your loving mom will take you to the zoo this summer. And by the time it works its way up to the oldest, the request is something like this. Could we go on a road trip to Alaska and see some grizzlies and moose and fly fish for salmon and have ice cream every day? <laughs> and at that point, the younger ones petition to change their requests to the requests of the older ones. Because they realized they didn't want enough. They didn't want hard enough. They didn't know they could ask for something this big. This election matters. We should take it seriously and we should do our part. But if we get to November and we're a little less focused on what we want and a little more enthralled with what Jesus wants, if our eyes are a little less turned toward Washington and a little bit more turned toward heaven, then we're getting caught up in Jesus' prayer. This week is mainly intro for this series, but I do want to spend a few remaining minutes on the first of Jesus' requests in these final few verses. Look with me at verse 21, the first thing that Jesus wants for us. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Does that surprise you? Does it surprise you that when Jesus turns to pray to the Father, the first thing he asks the Father for is that we might be one? I'll tell you why it doesn't surprise me. 
it doesn't surprise me because a little bit like Abraham Lincoln's presidential cabinet called a team of rivals, the early church was a group of people who should have mixed like oil and water. From that first 12, which had Roman collaborators and freedom fighters, to the house churches that consisted of enslaved people and enslavers, of, of Jewish followers of Jesus and devout pagan Gentile followers of Jesus. It was always going to be a miracle for the followers of Jesus to be one. And it doesn't surprise me because historically the greatest outpourings of the Spirit of God have been marked by extraordinary unity among the followers of Jesus across socioeconomic groups, across ethnic lines, across political lines. It, has, it is when the Spirit has stirred our hearts most to want what Jesus wants that we've most consistently acted as if we believe that in Christ there really is no longer Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female. That's what Paul wrote. It doesn't surprise me because the single thing that most consistently piques the interest of our neighbors here at 31st and Barclay is oneness in the church. They don't care or don't know when we give away money, and that's just fine. That's probably as it should be. They have zero interest in what our small groups are studying or what I'm preaching, and that's great. It's to be expected. They're grateful when we give away food or when we open up the building for community use, but what piques the interest of our neighbors is when they see people from different backgrounds, from different tax brackets, different age groups streaming into this building together on a Sunday morning and then walking out again, often to get lunch together, smiling. I hear about this. This is what I hear about most consistently from the neighbors. Sometimes that scene is downright confounding to people. I remember a neighbor who stopped me in the early years on the sidewalk just over there. She said, so is that a Korean church and a black church and a white church all in there together? Well, actually, we are one. We are trying to be one. Just a few weeks ago, a contractor working on one of the neighbor houses up here stopped me. All of those people from different backgrounds seem almost like they actually like each other, she said. And what she said next got me. I feel like you don't see that much in the church. And then this, do you think someone like me would be welcome? It doesn't surprise me that Jesus prayed that we would be one because it is nothing short of miraculous when it happens and because it raises extraordinary questions about what would bring and hold these people together. Three times in these verses, Jesus asks for this. Verse 21. I pray that they will all be one, just as you, Father, and I are one. Verse 22, so they may be one, just as we are one. Verse 23, may they experience such perfect oneness that the world will know. Seven verses in this prayer are dedicated to Jesus praying for us, those who will come to believe in Jesus through the witness of his first disciples. Three times in seven verses, what he's praying for is for us to be one. And you might have noticed uh, there's a little phrase that recurs there, describing the, the quality of the oneness that Jesus wants for us. Here it is. I, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, even as in the same manner that you and I are one. The oneness of the Father and the Son is the model and the supply for the oneness of the church. So our, our oneness with each other in the Spirit is modeled on and it's sourced in the oneness that the Father has with the Son. But it's also supposed to point to two things. I wonder if you noticed that. Twice Jesus asked that we would be one and he follows it up with a so that. Look with me at verse 21. I pray that they'll be one just as you and I are one as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Again, verse 23, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the, so that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Here's why I'm belaboring this. I guess, please tell us. 
if we were to try to get a glimpse into the nature of the oneness we're supposed to have based on the phrase just as, it's just as, it's the same as, it's even as the oneness between the Father and the Son, we pretty quickly end up in mystery because we're talking about the Trinity. We know that it is the deepest unity that exists. We know that it is the unity in diversity that underlies all that is. We know that it is a, uh, mutually honoring, mutually glorifying, and, and mutually self-giving. And that it's the most loving relationship behind all of reality. But pretty quickly, we're into mystery. Another way to, to try to get a glimpse of what this unity is meant to be like is to look at what Jesus expects to flow out of it, and then to reverse engineer. You understand what I'm saying? He says, two things ought to be deducible from this unity, and so we ought to look at what those things are and then reverse engineer. So Jesus' expectation is that oneness among Christians is going to result in two so-thats. Here's the first one. People will believe that the Son came from the Father. And the second one is that people will know that the Father loves us just as he loves the Son. Both of those are astonishing, but neither one is straightforward to me. Track with me here. Why should oneness among followers of Jesus lead to any conclusions about who sent Jesus? Why? What's the logical connection there? I'm going to walk us through this very quickly for time's sake. Here's how I think our oneness argues that Jesus was sent by the Father. One of Jesus' recurring concerns is that people believe that he was sent by the Father. This is, he's, he talks about it all the time through, uh, Jesus, uh, through John's Gospel, and we'll dive deeper on this in a later week. But I want to take you to one parade example, a heated exchange in chapter 10. It's Hanukkah, they're in Jerusalem, and people are pushing Jesus. They're like, Jesus, just tell us plainly, are you or aren't you the Messiah? And this is what Jesus responds in verse 25. I have already told you and you don't believe me. The proof, the evidence, the, the witness is the work that I do in my Father's name. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. They pick up stones and they try to stone him to death. Here's how the conversation goes on. We'll rejoin it. Verse 36. After all, the Father set me apart and sent, sent me into the world. Don't believe me unless I carry out my Father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miracle, miraculous works I have done, even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Here's what I want you to see. All through John's gospel, when you push Jesus to give evidence that he is sent by the Father, He's not going to answer with a theological treatise. He's going to answer it by saying, watch what I have done. Look at my behavior. Look at my conduct. It's like the metaphor operating in the background is, if you want to know if this ambassador is really an ambassador of the king, ask yourself, is he acting out the policies and the culture of that kingdom? Jesus says, look at what I've done. The Greek word is erga. Usually it gets translated works. Sometimes, without explanation, our translation sticks a miraculous in front of that, even though it's not there in the Greek. For sure, some of Jesus' works were miraculous, and many of them were not. But the point is, it's like Jesus is saying the godliness of his behavior is evidence of his godly source. After all, he told the disciples back in chapter 5, the son does nothing by himself. He does only what the father does. The father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. I think Jesus in this prayer in John 17 is suggesting that the same thing applies to us too. If his actions, his behavior, his conduct in the world was evidence that he came from God because he was living out God's policies, because living out the culture of the king, then so too our similar actions done in his name should make the same point. Jesus says, 
virtually the same thing in chapter 14, verse 10. Anyone who believes in me will do the same erga, the same works that I do, and even greater. There's a story told about John Wimber, an American pastor who came to faith in the early 1960s, just before the, um, the Jesus movement. And the story is told that he uh, came, leaned the weight of his life on Jesus, and people uh, discipled him, and, and he read through uh, the Gospels. And then he was like, okay, this is great. When do, we, when do we do the Jesus stuff? And they looked at him a little confused. Like, what, do you, what do you mean? Let's, let's start reading again. He's like, no, the reading, reading is great, but, but when do we do the Jesus stuff? When do we do the things that Jesus did? Francis Chan uh, makes a similar point sort of humorously. He's like, in many ways, American Christians are a little bit like a teenager who is told by his parents to go clean his room. And he comes back after a few minutes, and parents say, well, did you clean the room? And he said, well, no, but I had a great devotional about reading my room, or about cleaning my room. No, I actually meant clean your room. Go, go clean your room. And the kid goes back upstairs, and comes back a couple hours later. Well, how is it? Did you clean your room? Well, I almost know six and a half verses about cleaning my room. I'm, I'm not disparaging studying the Bible or devotions. I, I hope you've seen this morning how deeply I value this. But the way we live matters. And the things that we do in Jesus' name are meant to make it more believable that Jesus was sent from the Father. Paraphrase Leslie Newbegin, the community of Christ is the greatest apologetic for Christ. The way we live matters. We don't all have the same gifts. We're all called to pattern our lives after Jesus, but some followers of Jesus have gifts of great mercy and others have gifts of great faith and some have gifts of great evangelism and some have gifts of healing and and but but when when the church in concert does the works of Jesus in Jesus name that unity points to Jesus source in the father so remember we're, we're reverse engineering here we're thinking back from what Jesus says should be deducible from our unity First is that the Son was sent from the Father. The second, even faster, is that the Father loves the followers of Jesus just as he loves Jesus. Th that thought ought to trip your circuits. The Father loves you just as he loves the Son. We'll drill down deeper on that in a later week. But once more, we've got to dig back through John's gospel. I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version here. In chapter 15, Jesus says to his disciples, I have loved you even as, in the same way, in the same manner, same word, as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. May they be one even as we are one. I have loved you, the disciples, even as the Father has loved me. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus has loved his disciples with the same love as the Father has loved him. The love the Father has for the Son has been the model and the supply for the love of the Son for the disciples. So we need to ask ourselves, what does that love look like? What does the love that Jesus has loved his disciples with look like? Well, it looks like voluntarily laying down his life for their sakes. Chapter 10, verse 17. It looks like sharing himself with them and inviting them into his life. John 14, 24. It looks like humbling himself, putting their needs before his own, taking a basin and a towel and washing their feet. 13, verse 1. This is the love that quite literally has changed the world. If we're following Jesus' logic correctly, he seems to be saying that when Christians' oneness starts to look like that limitless love that Jesus showed to his disciples, the only natural conclusion is that that love must be sourced in the same place. That we must be loving one another with that same love that the Father has for the Son. They can only be loving this way if they are loved with the love of the Father had for the Son. 
is the conclusion. I told you before about the Hutu and Tutsi students who in the weeks leading up to the Rwandan genocide refused to shun one another, but in the university cafeteria took turns serving one another and eating together. That sort of oneness makes me believe that they were tapped into the same love the Father has for the Son. Where are Jesus' eyes fixed moments before his arrest? They're fixed on the face of the Father, pouring out his heart, what he desires to his Father in prayer. And what does Jesus want? Sharper still, what does Jesus want for us? He asks that we would be one. That we who have leaned the weight of our lives on Jesus would be one with the same self-giving, other-honoring, mutually loving oneness that the Son and the Father share. And that that oneness speaks about the divine sending of the Son and speaks about the love of God for each of us. I'm going to pray for us, but if you would like someone to pray for you personally, to pray with you, to listen to the Spirit of God with you and on your behalf, I invite you to take advantage of uh, the prayer team members who will be over by those banners. Um, if you go to them, you can voice a request or a praise, or if you're not sure why you're there or don't want to say it, you can just say, I'd love you to pray for me. And they might just pause. They might just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to them. So don't be afraid if there's some silence because we believe that God is at work and that he leads us and he invites us to pray in concert with him. Father, would you do among us by your spirit what I can't do with words? Oh, how... Our world needs a church that is one. Oh, how we need a church that is one. You say that we already are bound together in the unity of your spirit. Father, we confess that we have uh, eroded that unity. We have um, fought against that unity. But we pray that by your spirit, you would bring, restore unity in a way that speaks to an unbelieving world. Jesus is from the Father. In a way that reminds us even that almost beyond belief, you love us just as you love the Son. In his name we pray.